you know, the, what I love about the 50K is that, I mean, one, so much can go wrong. Like, I think my favorite thing about the 50K is like how easy it is to screw up. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklistan, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I took a very nice brisk walk before we taped today, so I am ready to go. <laughs> yes, in honor of our part two of our interview with Canadian race walker Evan Dunphy. Very nice. I'm ready. Good. Heel toe, heel toe. <laughs> Did you get that circular motion going too? I did. I got my hips don't lie. They were moving. <laughs> all right. Before we get to our interview with Evan, uh, let's give a shout out to all of our Patreon patrons. This show is pretty expensive to produce, especially as we go into Beijing, where we will have on the ground presence. So we appreciate our Patreon patrons for helping to support the show financially. You can become a patron today at patreon.com slash flamealivepod or go to flamealivepod.com and uh, look for the store link. Today we've got part two of our interview with Evan Dunphy. Evan is a, an Olympic race walker who raced for Canada at the 2016 Olympics, coming in fourth after some controversy, and he has qualified for Tokyo 2020. At the World Athletics World Champs in 2019, he won bronze in the 50K. Last week, we were supposed to talk about how race walking works, but that conversation went in a totally different direction. If you haven't listened to it, d do, because Marinovella talk, t bock talk, it's awesome. Uh, but this week, we are getting into the mechanics of the how race walking works. And of course... Our conversation with Evan took some other interesting directions. Take a listen. Let's talk about the sport itself and watching it a little bit better. How do you keep it to a walk and not a run? Because we, we learned before about like it, the motion is all in your hips and they kind of move in a circular way. But when you're going and trying to push it faster, how do you keep it to a walk? Yeah, I, for, for me, like I started race walking when I was 10 years old. And I, I like race walk while I was running. I still do. I've run the occasional, occasional race still sometimes for fun. To me, they're two completely different movements. You know, I've, I've never, there's that idea of, you know, people ask, oh, like, well, when you're, you're side by side, someone sprinting to the finish line, like, how do you not just break out into a run? And for me, that's not even an, an option. Like, it's just, they're so separated in my head as being these two distinct motor patterns, two distinct movements. That said, my, my, my running style probably resembles uh, that of a race walker. I don't have much knee drive or, uh, when I run, but, but to me, I, ca I, I can't really fathom the idea of breaking out into a run in that traditional sense um, during a race walk. Obviously, like running in a race walking sense where you're, you, know, you have both feet off the ground, you're lifting, you're still race walking, but you're, you, you've kind of gone beyond the your, your technical limits we would we would call that a run but mechanically it's just race walking illegally i guess would be the difference between that and like a, a traditional like getting your knees up and landing on your toes and like actually sort of running but yeah like i i probably am one of, i'm an athlete who could actually stand to like get more off the ground i can't lift as much as some of my competitors lift and that's the, that's another thing like race walking as i'm sure was talked about when you had the race walk officials on was race walking is judged by the human eye. So one of our biggest problems is we get attention every four years at the Olympics and all they do is show slow motion replays of all of us off the ground saying that we're cheating. And it's like, well, no, like cameras are just a lot better. Like humans kind of just suck at seeing things <laughs> and, and we're judged by humans. And, and like, that's just how it's always been. And like, if you want to change that, that's fine. If you want to bring technology and that's fine, but let's just realize at this point in time, we're off the ground, but we're not cheating. It's a hard thing to get people to buy into, I guess. 
and, and I'm one of the athletes who like is probably more stuck to the ground than, than most. And, and it certainly slows you down because any, any time you have flight, any flight phase you have is just bonus, bonus speed for not doing any extra work. But yeah, to, to, to the initial question, they're just completely distinct mo- movements for me. Okay. So you talked about lift and you talked about how you're more down to the ground. I don't even know my question, but I just want to like, <laughs> when you say lift, it is that when you try to get more lift, what are you trying to do with your body? And the lift, I guess, helps propel you forward. Yeah. Yeah. So like any, so your flight phase is what sort of, so, so race walking is supposed to be a progression of steps where, you know, one foot is always on the ground. The speeds that we're going at, because it's judged by the human eye, the human eye can only, only process visual information at about four hundredths of a second. So if you're lifting, if you're, if you have both feet off the ground for about four hundredths of a second, the judges can't pick that up. So the best race walk technique is being off the ground for about four hundredths of a second. Uh, and so you, you try, you know, that, that's you try to push that, that that limit of, of what you can get away with. There are, it's, it's not quite that simple because there are, you know, judges, because judges are human, they aren't always looking at the same thing. So, so one of the things that you'll see with race walking versus running is like our heads don't bob up and down at all. You know, you can, you can draw a straight line across us. You know, if you had a stationary camera and someone walked by it, like that kind of that, that image of, of, you know, the, the prep school girls walking with the books on their head, old school, kind of like that style. Like you could do that with a race walk. You could put books on their head and they, they wouldn't fall off. So some judges will look at that. Some judges, even like for girls, ponytails, they'll look and see if like the ponytail is bouncing because of the, if you're going up and down, then technically that you should be off the ground. And so there are different things that like form that judges like holistic opinion of like what lifting is for better or for worse. So there are some athletes that if you slow them down, they might be lifting more than others, but they never get lifting calls for other reasons. And then some athletes might be more on the ground, but they have, you know, other parts of their technique don't look as good. And so they get more calls. So there, there is a little bit of subjectivity to it, which is not great, obviously, but I think, I think most athletes in race walk agree though, that like the intrinsic validity from you know you kind of the consistency of judging is there so you know you at least know what you're getting which is probably more important than anything else as long as that judging is consistent time after time then you can adapt to it and know what has to how how to get how to get through a race but i'm probably like closer to that 0.2 seconds off the ground and so I could benefit from, you know, trying to get to that point four. And that's just, it's a little bit tech, technique. It's a little bit like pushing harder with your feet and just allowing yourself to kind of, you know, travel through that air that little bit more. But um, especially for me as a, as a 50K walker, predominantly 50K is my, my main event that, that there's just less lifting because you're going slower. So you'll, you'll have way less lifting in, in the 50K than you do in the 20K just as a product of the pace being slower. So then 50K is just really a lot more focus on endurance and maintaining the form for that long? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the, what I love about the 50K is that, I mean, one, so much can go wrong. Like, I think my favorite thing about the 50K is like how easy it is to screw up. You, you look at a marathon, like so marathons, you know, they're guys are run, the top guys are running those in just over two hours. Top women are running them in, you know, two hours, under two hours and 20 you run out of carbohydrates at a, you know, somewhere between that like hour 40 to hour mark. So, you know, for the most part, there's not that much time that, that if you run out of energy, you're going to be suffering for it. There's the, there's the wall in, in the marathon that, that people are familiar with. And if you're running a two hour marathon, eh, you're, you're not really dealing with that wall at all. Race walk in the 50 K it's a three hour and 45 minute race, three hour, 40 minute race. That wall's at the same point. Now that that point where you run out of energy, like stored carbohydrates, is still at that sort of two-hour mark. So you got to be taking in enough carbohydrate during the race to get you through it. You got to be fueling yourself. You got to be hydrating yourself properly. So like so much can go wrong, and I love that because I stand on the start line knowing that I'm not the most genetically gifted. You know, I know there's guys around me that have higher VO2 maxes and and you know have are just are just better than me. But I can do all those little things 
better than they can and that closes the gap and so you know it really for me it's this kind of puzzle almost compared to the 20k just like okay who can who can race walk the fastest for 20k and the 50k is all right who can race walk the fastest but also take in the most fuel make sure they get enough you know water in make sure they don't overheat all that stuff it just becomes a factor and i for me i love that because it makes me sort of believe that i can outperform better athletes who are better than me so how do you put that puzzle together like how do you figure out oh i need this much water at this point and this much fuel at this point uh so i i work with sports nutritionists we do we've done a lot of sports nutrition like studies um which are really fun but you know i have a i have an amazing team that that sort of helps me and then i also my background is in in sports science and kinesiology so i love being able to kind of figure stuff out on my own as well so you know a lot of it is trial and error but a lot of it is following the science knowing what's what's available what's out there and then just figuring out best practices like it's it's not as difficult as athletes make it seem to be on, on the basis of how many athletes do it poorly <laughs> you know it, with how many athletes do it poorly you'd think it's really really complicated but it's not <laughs> it's you know, i i've had i've had race walk friends who talk to marathon runners who who were surprised that we eat breakfast before our long runs and it's like, what are you? Yeah, you're going out and running for two hours. Why are you not eating breakfast before that? <laughs> it, it, so it is, it is mind boggling to me, like how much like people get caught up in like tradition of, oh, this is how it's always been done. So this is how we do it. And it's like, yeah, but that's not the best way to do it. And there's lots of evidence to say that this is the best way to do it. So do it that way, um, which is what we try to do. You know, that our, my little team is, is, is focused on like, okay, this is the best way to do things. This is, this is how we're going to do it. So for, for fueling, like I have a, a fueling plan for 50Ks that basically takes into account how much I'm drinking and eating every two kilometers. Um, so in race walking, we race on a, on a one or a two kilometer loop. Major championships are usually two kilometer loops. Um, and that's so that you have the judges that are able to watch the entire race. You know, if we had like a marathon where we're going through the streets, like you'd have to move the judges around or you'd have to have dozens and dozens of judges so racing on the loop kind of takes away those those issues but it also presents an amazing opportunity to be super detailed in in those plans so at major championships i'll have a scale i'll have my bottles i'll figure out how much i want to drink every two kilometers all that will be figured out with like what percentage of carbohydrate those drinks are based on what the weather is and how much water i think i need and how to get to my like fueling goals and all that stuff will all be calculated beforehand. And then we'll have uh, whoever's on the drinks table for me will weigh my bottle before and after I drink to know exactly to the milliliter how much I took in that lap. They'll relay that information back to me on the next lap. So I know if I need to drink more or less to make up for or to, you know, to make sure I'm still on track. So we're, we're really, we're really, really into the weeds with it, making sure that like ev that all those little details are taken care of. And I'll, in a 50K race, I'll take in about 1,500 calories during the race. And about, in a hot race, about four liters of, of fluid. And how much do you expend during a race? The part of the prop, as I say that we're really into the weeds and we try to do everything best practice, I will admit that most of the times I've missed my post-race weigh-ins because I just, I after a 50K, I just don't care anymore. Um, so I actually don't know, my sweat rate's, I know my sweat rate is around 1.5 to 2 liters an hour. So if we're only taking in a liter per hour, which is about the most your stomach can handle, still on the higher end, losing four liters of water um, net. I should, I, someone, someone weighed me after Doha. So someone knows how much, how much weight I lost. I should find out who that person was. They were, I should, I should preface that with, they were someone who should have been weighing me. They weren't just some random <laughs> asking for my weight. I went, hey, Allison, there's a new job for us. Just with the scale at the end. But what do you want to weigh? Just run around with the scale. I, want to, I just want to weigh you. It's fine. Okay. So I wanted to ask about the, about focus because for three and a half hours, obviously there's a lot to think about with the, what you're consuming, but what else, I mean, what do you think about for three and a half hours as you're just walking in a circle? Yeah, I I find like in a race, I end up getting really focused on, okay, like, what well, you know, what was my split the last two kilometers? All right, what does that put me on pace for? Is that about what I think I'm capable of doing? How do I feel? How do the guys around me look? 
oh, how many, like, does this, the, oh, this guy in this group has, you know, has already gotten one red card. Like, hmm, should we push the pace to see if we can get him another red card? And, oh, this person looks like they're starting to fall off the back of the group. Like, oh, if we put a surge in here, like maybe we could drop them or I, I spend, yeah. I, I, and I go through that like repetition. And then I think, oh, okay, I, uh, how much did I get enough water? Like, ooh, like how do and I, I go through that kind of repetition, like every, every lap almost. Certainly early in the race, try not to think at all. You just try and like turn off mentally. And I'm in, in Doha, uh, I remember like the, my, my teammate and I, our race strategy was just, we were just going to sit at the back, like sit near the back and just be very, very patient and move our way through the field. And so when it came time to start like, on the start line, when they were saying like on your marks, like him and I were still like maybe three or four meters behind the start line, like chatting, like we, <laughs> You know, it wasn't like, you know, everyone else is sort of up there with their hand on their watch, getting, you know, getting ready to charge off the start line for a four hour race, um, which seems a little silly, but we were just hanging back, kind of chatting, had our like cold towel still wrapped around us. And then the race started we're like, oh, okay, let's go. And, and kind of just, you know, spent the first couple K chatting. We were joking about how the race was playing out exactly how we wanted it to in our minds with like the two of the guys going off the front and being like, oh, this is perfect. Like they're going to kill each other off. Like this is, this is working out just how we wanted and like chatting and joking with each other and chatting to like our coaches on the sidelines and stuff when we get a chance to, and just trying to stay like really relaxed is sort of my best strategy. Cause I, I know that I train really well. You know, I, I'm, I know that I'm one of like the best trainers in the world, but that hasn't always translated into being one of the best racers in the world. But I really try to take that same attitude of like, okay, well, if I just, treat this like I do in training, then that's usually like pretty successful for me. So, so my mantra a lot of times is just like, Hey, it's just like training, just, just like training. And when I won the Pan Am games in 2015 at home in Toronto, I charged off the front of the race, two kilometers of the race, ended up like walking the entire thing on my own. And I remember just every like couple of minutes being like, it's okay. It's just, it's just a training session. It's just, you're out to do, you know, you're up to do a 12 K tempo now, you know, or oh, 8 K of your tempo left not ever thinking of myself as being, you know, in this championship race with some of the best guys in the world chasing me from behind. I was just like, no, it's just like training, just like treat this as you would any other hard training session on your own. And that that's for me where I find success. Other athletes are completely different. Like we have athletes who are the loveliest, most relaxed, kindest people, you know, you get into the call room and sunglasses on like battle, you know, war face like it's it's going to battle and you're just like you wouldn't dare talk to them and so you know every athlete has to find that that ideal performance state or you know that that level of ampedness that that is is ideal for them and and for a 50k race walk i don't think that level of ampedness is very high because <laughs> you know you, you get really amped and then the gun goes and you're like okay i got four hours of this <laughs> it's not like a you know an 800 meter race where you need to be like all right, let's, let's do this. You know, I can, let's go. And I'm going to put everything into this for a minute and 45 seconds. Like, oh, no, I got, I can, I can worry about being amped in three hours. Is there ever any trash talking during the race? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a lot of time. I mean, it's, it's net, it's sometimes the guys don't speak English and then you're like, oh, that, that one didn't land, but more so stuff on when I've been on the sidelines. So, so we've had the, our world race walking cup in 2016, um, was in Rome and Alex Swatzer, who won the 50 K race in 2008, beat my, my close friend, Jared talent 2012. He didn't get to compete because he tested positive for EPO, you know, went on this big crying thing about how he was stressed and went to Turkey and bought EPO and all this stuff. And then it turned out that he was working with Dr. Ferrari and potentially had been on drugs even in 2008 and all blah, 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 blah. And had said, he's going to retire from sport and got his, his figure skating girlfriend suspended because she made him lie for him and all this stuff. And then in 2016, all of a sudden I'm coming back, I'm going to compete in Rio. He got a late entry into the world cup, having not qualified for it and basically, you know, won the race with ease. And so during that race, because I raced the 20K the day before, so I was there watching. And I just spent three and a half hours hurling abuse at this drug cheat. You know, we knew his pseudonym that he had used on Twitter to defend himself. So I was yelling that at him. I was, you know, I was going to going deep into the well of, 
<laughs> of any references I could think of. And and after the race, he won that race, and Jared was second again behind him. And at the medal ceremony, I just, as they were walking up to the podium, I was walking beside him, just, just hurling abuse at him, asking him how he sleeps at night, like just all this terrible stuff. And I got kicked out of the medal ceremony. <laughs> Um, not surprisingly, you know, I, I feel really bad for the, the woman at, at, at World Athletics who had to come and ask me to leave because she was well within her right to ask me to leave. <laughs> and, but at the same time, they turned out that they needed Alex to do a race because they had a, a suspicious sample on him from January, but they were, it was using the new urine passport that you needed to have a race, uh, a race test in order to trigger the additional analyses of the original test so they needed him to race so that they could go and test that old sample and then in that old sample they found steroids and he got suspended again and got that gold medal taken away from him and jared became the gold medalist and i became completely justified in everything i was doing and it was it was fantastic but now he's back and he's claiming that it was all a conspiracy and that a, a, a italian court has ruled in his favor even though cass has found no merit in his case and you know there there's lots of telenovelas in race walking that you could choose from these days yeah i would think that doping is really problematic for your sport absolutely i mean and the and the russians dominated race walking for a generation basically so jerry talent um who just retired just announced his retirement last week He's he's won four global titles, either like Olympics, world champs, or world race walking championships. Won four global titles, never crossed the finish line first. Never got to stand on top of the podium and hear the national anthem be played. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in prize money that he'll never see. You know, the, the endorsements that come with being an Olympic gold medalist. He became the Olympic gold medalist, you know, a month before he became the Olympic silver medalist because he got his gold medal from London in 2016. Yeah, so... The, and he really inspired me to like I, I got the first train with him in 2012 and that was kind of when I learned how to train properly and really dedicated myself to being like the best athlete I possibly could be. And he's been very vocal for clean sports. Um, in 2008, when he finished third behind Valerie Borshin, who won the 20K race, who had failed a test a month before the games. And then they just, the Russians went, no, that didn't happen and let him compete. And, and Jared sat there next to him and said, no, this guy's a drug cheat. He shouldn't be here. Like, so, you know, all the credit that, that, that everyone gets in like 2015 for being vocal about Russian doping, like Jared was doing that back in 2008 and really blazed the trail for, for the race walkers to be vocal. So the race walkers have always been very vocal about clean sports. And that's one of the things I love about it is that, you know, again, there's also not much money in it. So like, you know, I'm not at risk. I can be a lot more vocal and say what I think, cause I'm not, I don't have any sponsors that, you know, want me to play nice and and do all that stuff so you know that's kind of I guess there's the reasonings why we're, we're able to do what we do and, and not many people are paying attention to us so we can get away with being a little bit more vocal but yeah certainly that's a huge issue and, and Alex Watzer wants to come back for for Tokyo and I mean it won't happen but but um, just the fact that you know it's being talked about just shows that doping still a huge issue. Well, and that's another problematic thing about the IOC is that they kind of want to sweep stuff under the rug and make things nice, but this problem keeps popping back, it seems like. And, you know, if they don't really do something besides a slap on the wrist, things don't change. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recently learned that the International Testing Authority Agency, international whatever the ITA stands for, was originally supposed to be called the Independent Testing whatever the A stands for. And, and we're basically told by a Swiss court, no, you can't do that. You're not independent. And the IOC still touts like, oh, we have this robust independent organization dealing with testing. It's like, well, they're not. Like the courts have decided that they're not. So yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's there's a lot of, again, me good messaging with you know, not a whole bunch of substance behind it. Back to a little technique. How do you take the turns? on your loop because you got to do a lot of turns so what do you do do you do anything what do you do that's different it's so sometimes you get really lucky and have races with really nice turns so at the london world championships in 2017 we actually had one of our turnarounds was around the um the victoria monument in front of buckingham palace so really nice big roundabout was perfect also you get to wave to the queen every lap which was exciting 
not as exciting as 2012 when I was there as a spectator, very, very drunk across the street from the Queen. That was probably more fun, but the turns are very, very difficult, I find. Um, I just did a race on Friday, actually, and it, we, my coach and I literally just measured out with a steel tape 500 meters on a drag strip <laughs> at a race course and put a cone down at zero meters, put a cone down at 500 meters, and was like, okay, hey, this is our one kilometer loop. And we figured actually that I probably walked about 20.2, 20 20.3 kilometers because, you know, every lap, there's no way that I can just come around the corner and turn on a dime. So every, every turn I was adding about three or four meters to get around that corner. But it, it really, the technique isn't really that different. It's just having to like slow yourself down a little bit. And then that becomes like a huge deceleration and then a huge acceleration. And, and that's really taxing on your body. So it does the, the turn just more than anything just take a lot out of you because you're constantly having to like slow yourself down and speed back up. And then to be honest, some athletes just jog around the corners. If there's not a judge on the corner, like we have some footage of some races where it's just, it's a bit of a farce. Like athletes will come around, come into the corner, take like three or four jog steps and then start race walking again. So now we see a lot more often we have judges who are actually on the corner, making sure the athletes are actually walking around it. Uh, yeah. Um, again, it's, it's probably an issue that's greater at the 20 K um, especially early on in a race. I remember in the Olympics in, in the 20 K, like there's a group of like 40 of us on a one K loop, all walking together on, a, you know, and the road's probably the equivalent of like a three lane road. And so you come into these corners and, and guys are getting their, their numbers ripped off their backs, their shoes are getting stepped on. And, and it's, it is a little bit of mayhem. And, and at that point you basically, it's an accordion, you know, the first guys go into the corner, everyone else, comes together and then the top guys are stopped basically like a traffic jam and then have to pick it back up so you know it, it is more than anything i'd say it's just it's just physically taxing than 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 mechanically difficult do the courses always go in the same direction so are you always turning left or are you always turning right or does it reverse which i'm hoping you're going to say yes so in, in my experience, funnily enough, so when we're in countries where you drive on the right, you turn left. And when we're, when we race in Australia, we turn right. And it's something that I'd never thought about until, but I think probably my third race in Australia where I went, hey, wait a second. <laughs> like, wait, every time I've raced here, we've, we've walked on the left-hand side and turned right. Very strange. And I've only ever had one race where it was a mixture. So that race in Rome was kind of like a S like a S shape where you had like one right hand turn and two left hand turns every loop, which was interesting. It kind of was kind of nice because it kept everything pretty compact. So, so you could see the entire race kind of unfold from one vantage point, which was good for made it very spectator friendly. Well, I'm also thinking just the physical balance. Like I would think if you're constantly turning in one direction, that foot gets a lot of the, you know, the outside of that foot would take a lot of abuse. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really cool to be able to have a race where you kind of almost did it in like a figure eight shape where like in the middle of the loop, you cross over. And then, so like you're doing one turn one way and the other turn the other way. That'd be really interesting. Uh, you'll def definitely uh, get on the tracks. So, like when we do big track workouts or, or if we race, race on the track, almost always the race walkers end up like warming up and cooling down, going the opposite direction. Cause one, they're just bored of going the same way. And two, you just feel like, yeah, that, that, that inside leg, that left leg of going, doing 50 laps of the track is just kind of like done with it. And so you just try to undo, <laughs> undo everything by going the opposite direction. Okay. So now this is, you'll, you'll totally get where I'm going here. I just had the mental image of the judge just yelling reverse <laughs> in the middle of the race <laughs> and everybody's got to go the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> like kind of like a, like a like a duck duck go almost well i was thinking like roller rings from when i was a kid and all of a sudden it was reverse and everyone had to skate the opposite direction i'll walk i'll walk <laughs> i i have this image now of, of her of her brooks um or or uh whoever it was who played her brooks in the in, in miracle just yelling again <laughs> again um how many pairs of shoes do you go through in a year a lot. So my, typically I would get about 400 K out of a pair of shoes, um, which for me is maybe three weeks. I will, I will do a little plug here for, for my, my, my shoe sponsor, new feel. Cause they, they make like race walking specific shoes. And since I started wearing those the last year, I found for whatever reason, I've been getting like 800 K out of them. So I've like doubled the lifespan of my shoes, which has been very nice. 
but it's still not very much. Like it's still, you're still going through, you know, a pair of shoes every six weeks, maybe. Um, and that like annoyingly changes wildly with like the road you're training on or the temperature outside. So when we train in Australia in 38 degrees, the shoes don't last nearly as long as when I'm training at home in the winter, just because you know, there's so much more heat in the road and, and you're just basically burnt. You're basically burning through, through the pair of shoes. So what is it about your new shoes that is different from a regular pair? I think they must, they must just have more like a thicker rubber on the bottom. Like, so the, I guess those, the shoes I had before, like it was a thin layer of rubber that was just there for traction. And then you have your foam underneath. Whereas these ones I think have like a little bit more rubber that's there for traction, but also durability. And I don't think running shoes are typically mostly running shoes aren't made with durability in mind because then you would sell less running shoes. <laughs> kind of true. <laughs> Oh, let's talk about the fundraising you were doing for Kids Sport because you couldn't go to Australia this year. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, so Kids Sport's a, a local charity based in it's Canada wide, but it was sort of started in British Columbia, and their mission is really simple. It's just like, all right, sports are expensive. Some kids, you know, families can't afford to put them in sports. That's not fair. Let's let's help more kids play sports. So so they'll pay, um, you know, towards registration fees for kids who can't afford it they have such a low barrier to, to entry. Like you, you can just apply. You don't need to prove your need for it. You don't have to prove like there's, there's really nothing stopping people from, from accessing the support. So I love that. Um, and I got involved with the Matthew Olympics in 2016. I got invited out to an event. It was like an adult sports day where, you know, everyone ran around. The, the firefighters were there with, with their truck and had like a little relay race set up where you had to put the fire suit on and, and unroll, unravel a hose and, and, and hook it up and fill up a bucket of water and stuff like that. And, and egg and spoon races and you had wheelchair basketball. And it was just like, it was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And they raised I don't know, it was something like a hundred thousand dollars, some of that, that day. And I was like, okay, this is the coolest thing ever. And, and we got free food. Like, can I come back? And, and basically since then I, I've just become a kid sport ambassador and, and helped out with all, you know, whenever, they've had local events and stuff been able to if they want athletes there for it just there and being an ambassador and eating free food and and in 2018 we had a really early year I, I, we had commonwealth games our world cup all that stuff was done early in the year so we had nothing for the second half of the season and i just kind of thought all right well huh i, I should do something i, I kind of want to like i have nothing no major competition like, all right, let's do this, this thing. It's, it was kids sports 25th anniversary. So I decided I was going to walk 25 K a day for 25 days and throughout the fall, talk to 25 schools. And, and we ended up raising $26,000. I spoke to over 10,000 kids sharing sort of my journey in sport and then the, the value of sport that I think um, exists and, and all this different stuff. And, you know, walked my 625 K and it was just so fantastic and, and just loved it. And so building off that success this year coming into into january not being down in australia having to do like my big base training on my own in the vancouver winter i was kind of like man i just i'm not very motivated for this like i just need i need that little spark and one of our local running running groups is doing a virtual event where it's just run as many kilometers as you can in, in january you know get these badges for every milestone you hit and all this stuff and they had kids sport as one of their partners. So I thought, okay, this is, a, this is perfect. I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this and run with it basically, or walk with it, I guess. And, and so I just took it upon myself to make, make my own website and set everything up and basically just said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to walk 600 K and I'm looking, I'm hoping to get $10 for every K I walk. So let's, let's see if we can raise $6,000. And some of my, some of my sponsors, CLE threw in a bunch of hats to give away uh, one of the Vancouver running stores, Van Runco, gave me a couple of shirts to give away. So we did a few giveaways. We just, yeah, ended up just making a big event of it and, and ended up raising $9,000 for kids sports just through walking. And it was so fantastic because because for me, it's like I, I want to, you know, give back to my community, but it's like, all right, what are my skills? Like my only skill is, or my main skill is I can walk relatively fast for long periods of time. Like, you know, it's not a particularly useful skill in this day and age, I think, you know, it, it, back in World War One, I, I would have been a great messenger. I would have, you know, I could have delivered, you know, I could have delivered messages from the front. Um, great mail carrier, but that's going out of fashion these days. So I was like, oh, how do I use this ability to walk fast to, to do good? 
and, and, you know, this is what we've sort of come up with and it's, it's awesome. So I love being able to, to use that. And that's one of my messages to the kids is like, all right, like set really, really audacious goals and then follow those goals with like an unrelenting passion. But at a certain point, you got to take a step back, look at how far you've come and then use, use that progress and use what you've learned to give back. And, and so I'm sort of at that stage now where I'm trying to use the skills I've acquired to to give back and, and help lift up those behind me. Oh, okay. So post racing career, do you have a secret dream to work for the postal office? I mean, it would be, it'd be so awesome. I would just, it would, it would just, it would be great. I, I, there's has to be, I've the other thing I've thought of is being a, a dog walker. You know, how many, like, I don't think they're going to, I don't think my target audience will be listening to this. How many pretentious moms out there would pay a very high premium to tell their mom friends that their dogs are walked by the fastest walker in Canada. You know, that's, that's what I'm thinking. That's my angle. I think I could, you know, do a really high class, high brow target that, 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 you know, upper echelon society who can't walk their own dogs and just position myself as like, you can get your dogs walked by the best walker. Okay, may I also suggest you walk toddlers? <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, I would do that, but I would not. I would. That's open to everyone. That would be because that would just be fun. That would be so much fun. Like I would not, I would not go after the the pretentious uh, uh, demographic on that. I would be like anyone whose kid wants a walk, let's do this because that would just be enjoyable. <laughs> just wear that kid and that dog out. That would be awesome. <laughs> That is how, that is how, I mean, we think so much about how we grow the sport. That's how we do it. We just get, we get them, we get them hooked when they're, when they're two, three, four years old. There we go. I think we're onto something here. World athletics. Give us a call. (laughs) (laughs) Evan, thank you so much. When do you take off for Tokyo? Do you know yet? No idea. We'll we'll hopefully have more information in the next round of the playbooks, and then we can start putting those finishing touches on. We kind of have three plans right now, and then we'll just we'll kind of figure out which one works best with with what we're told to do. All right. Oh, you know, I do have one last question because you like speaking your mind. What do you think about the Rule Fifty controversy? Oh, yeah. I mean, I find it very like really interesting. I mean. The, the one thing that I find really interesting is the athletes who are very vocal about abolishing it and, and, and you know, listening to the athlete, they're very much listening to the, like they say, listen to the athletes, listen to the athletes. Canadian Olympic Committee Athletes Association, I think it does an amazing job. And they did a whole big survey getting the athlete input. I know the Germans did the exact same thing. And a bunch of, a bunch of the athlete commissions have done the same thing. And what I find really funny is because I, I'm, I've, think I'm in favor of abolishing the rule. I, I, there's nuances that, that I can be swayed on and, and all this, but I think generally I, I tend towards the, the abolish completely side of things, but that's not what the, the overall average athlete voice is. Like all these surveys that come out of these athlete commissions find that there's way more nuance to it. But those who are the most vocal on social media about abolishing it ironically don't want to listen to that to that athlete voice and so i i find that hilarious because it's just it's just the the hypocrisy is like right there right in your face so i i yeah i i find it's a, it's a fascinating discussion i mean i love how the ioc you know they'll prop up john carlos and tommy smith and 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 you know whenever that's expedient for them to to celebrate they'll do so and but it'll i mean it'll be incredibly interesting to see how Tokyo goes. It'll be incredibly interesting to see how Beijing goes. You know, I think rule 50 is kind of this metaphor for kind of the, the troubles the IOC is going to be facing, especially next year with, with Beijing. And, and in all honesty, like, I think this is probably the most, most telling time the IOC has had since probably the interwar period where they're, they're not at, their future isn't, as secure as it was a few years ago. And so I think how these next two years go is going to be incredibly pivotal to the direction and the future of of the Olympic movement, more so than than in recent history. And I think think Rule 50 plays a prominent kind of role in 
you know, probably a marker of where those tides are going. I think where Rule 50 goes will be a good indication of, of where the Olympic movement is going. So I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I'm intrigued by the discussion. And yeah, yeah, we'll see where it goes, where it leads to. Yeah, it's definitely, it's really nuanced. It's that it is so fascinating to see trying to get a common playing field or, you know. Yeah, or, or even just like, yeah, what average what average Joe athlete wants is just a very different from what loud Jane athlete wants. Like it's 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 even within like even if you take out all of the you know the the human rights and, and like that element of the discussion, just the 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 part of the discussion is like of of what that what do the athletes want is incredibly nuanced as well. And I, I think that's I, I find that really really sort of fascinating and, and, and interesting. And then the whole human rights stuff is just a, a, a larger element that, that is thrown on top of that. That's kind of like, it just makes it, that makes the whole thing just kind of wild. And I mean, athletics is dealing with that with, with inter, the intersect stuff as well, where there's all these sort of discussions in, in sport right now that you're like, Oh God, it is so hard to have a black and white opinion. Like, <laughs> like we've gotten to this point where we've made so much progress in, you know, in dealing with, the easiest inequities to like deal with have kind of at least for the most part been dealt with. I say that as someone who's in the only track and field event that doesn't have a women's equivalent at the Olympics for at least one March cycle when the solution was just to get rid of the men's event. But we've dealt with those sort of, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, if you will, of inequity. And now we're getting into sort of the more, the, the more nuanced discussions and it's like, yeah, this isn't black and white. Like there is, there is some gray here. There is some room for people to have like differing opinions to an, to, you know, within, within still a progressive equitable framework, there's still a differing opinion. So, I don't know. I find, I find that it's going to be such a fascinating, interesting time for the next couple of years in sport. Yeah. Because you have, it's very easy to say, okay, like, in 36, when you're talking about discriminating against Jewish athletes or times where you're discriminating against, but we can all pretty easily say that's wrong. Yeah. And, 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 and Thomas Bach isn't Avery Brundage. Um, so <laughs> thank goodness. <you> know? <laughs> so now we're getting um, into these issues where good people thinking very deeply, trying to do the right thing, still come up with different answers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We talk about this a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know. I, I, I love it. Like, I, I find it like, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't really have anything more to say about it than just like it's fascinating. It, it, is, it is such an interesting place to be at in sport now where, where we can have these discussions. And I, I, I find it interesting, like even just talking to friends, because it's gotten to the point now where like friends that aren't, don't care about sports are kind of aware of these issues with especially like the, the intersexed and, and trans athlete issues. And it's so interesting to like kind of be able to bring you know, my perspective or like my kind of like people that have friends that have a really progressive lens in, in that part of society, but don't have the sport element out on top of it. It's really interesting to then like kind of get to, to introduce them to the nuances of like the sport world and, and, and see how they apply their lens to that, you know, new information that they didn't have about like sport uh, and see what they come up with as, as, as their opinion. Um, as opposed to me who came at it with like sport was my initial. And then I like, I've tried to listen to those voices and apply those voices on top of my sporting lens. It's just, it's really interesting to see the differences that you, that you come towards from those different areas. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Excellent. Well, Evan, thank you so much. Really appreciate this. We'll be cheering. Oh, you are officially a citizen of Shuklistan. So we will be cheering for you. Come Tokyo. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Evan. You can follow Evan at Evan Dunphy on Twitter and Insta. He is and Evan Dunphy on Strava. I forgot about this last week. If uh, Strava is a running app, I believe, and you can follow people. So he is Evan Dunphy on Strava, and his website is DunphyWalks.com. It's only appropriate that our conversation would take a different direction because we're trying to keep our legs balanced. <laughs> Clockwise, <laughs> counterclockwise. Do you feel... Eight. Do you feel better after talking about that? Because that was some one of the issues you had. Like, how do you how do you turn 
and, and I know it, so I I actually do like to walk I have a dog we take a lot of long walks we take a lot of fast walks because she's got little legs and they gotta go really fast sort of like me and when you go to make a quick turn you know that's when you're gonna roll an ankle you know that's that's when the injuries are gonna happen mm-hmm so when he was discussing, you know, some people kind of cheat and do a little jog and something, I was like, yeah, because that makes total sense that the turns are where everything goes crazy. Yeah, I can imagine. And probably and a lot probably of elbowing. crashes at the turns. And I think race walking would be a lot more fun if you put dogs in there. Like a, <laughs> if we, I truly believe if we have horses in the Olympics, why can't we have dogs? That's a slippery slope. It's kind of like the service animal thing, because then you could have otters. You could probably have other things, too. What are otters going to do? Uh, something cute. Well, that's true. Why don't we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive? Welcome to Shook Flistan. Leslie Klein has been named Director, Athletic Relations for LA28, and she will ensure athlete perspectives and viewpoints are integrated into the planning and execution of 2028. Very excited for her. I know. And that's another front lawn we can camp out on. (laughs) Our cross-country skier, Keegan Randall, was one of 15 female athletes chosen for EY's Women Athletes Business Network Class of 2021. So congratulations to her for that honor. Uh, Don Bigsby from Olympin was featured in an article, I guess, discussing the how pin collectors are not going to be allowed at Japan this year. Yeah, that's really rough. I, feel, I do feel all the pin collectors are, are they're, they're a little sad by this. And of course, especially when I'm in some of the pin collector communities on Facebook and they keep posting more Japanese and more Tokyo 2020 pins. And you know, there's a whole subset of collectors in Japan who will get to collect pins. And I'm sure there's going to be some surreptitious trading as people go from venue to venue. How can there not be? I mean, you but they can won't reach... get the pins from the other countries. Yeah. That's going to be the hard thing. And so some... now I think 2020 pins are going to be this interesting commodity in the market. Exactly. Because uh, one of the, the moderators of this group said that some NOCs are not making pins at all this year they don't want to encourage the trade exactly exactly so it'll be interesting to see how many national olympic committees actually do make pins for their country and how many get out into circulation in in with traders so that'll be interesting to see what happens team schuster got into the quarterfinals at the world's men curling championships but lost to switzerland seven to six in that last game so that's really sad. They played really well, but they the good thing is they clinched a quota spot for the U.S. at Beijing 2022 and for John to go back for his, oh gosh, he started at Torino, I think. So, that sounds right. So this is what, 2006, 10, 14, five. 18. This would this be would his be fifth Olympics, but he's got to get through the U.S. trials first. So good luck to you on that. Hammer thrower Deanna Price set a new American record of 78.6 meters. Very excited for her. That boat's well going into the summer. Oh, I'm so excited for her. <laughs> uh, artistic swimmer Jacqueline Simino raked in the hardware at leg two of the FINA Artistic Swimming World Series in Budapest. She won four gold medals. Her duet won both technical and free. And then her solo also won the technical and free. Bill Andrews has been appointed to the board of directors at Let's Empower, Advocate, and Do, Inc., an organization that provides mental health curriculum for schools, camps, organization, and athletics. He'll be chair of the fundraising committee. I tell you, you know, CEO of USA Weightlifting gets around. He is on so many podcasts and does so many articles, and now he gets to do more good work. And finally, author David Davis has won a Christopher Award for his book, Wheels of Courage, How Paralyzed Veterans from World War II Invented Wheelchair Sports, Fought for Disability Rights, and Inspired a Nation. And the Christopher Awards were established by Father James Keller to salute media that affirm the highest values of the human spirit 
and their goal is to encourage men, women, and children to pursue excellence in creative arenas that have the potential to influence a mass audience positively. Award. Well, that book was excellent. It was excellent, and it was positive. <laughs> and we're, I'm, I'm very excited for David. That was really nice it, well to get deserved, that Very well deserved. Exactly. And if you haven't read that book yet, you should. You can get a copy at our bookshop.org site. That's bookshop.org slash flamealivepod. We get a little commission from the books purchased through our link, and I know we've got David's book up there. You could also still get our book Foxcatcher. That's part of our book club series. And uh, the the money we earn from that helps go towards funding our on-the-ground coverage at Beijing 2022. We are constantly adding new titles to that storefront, so check it out. It is the 25th anniversary of the Atlanta 1996 Olympics, so every week we're looking back at some of the stories from these games. My turn this week, so I decided to look at race walking since we talked with Evan. How appropriate. I know. All right, so race walking. The men had a 20K and a 50K race, as they do today. The women had a 10K. And now this is only the second Olympics for women's race walking. It was introduced in Barcelona. Atlanta is the second and final time for the 10K. It was bumped up to a 20K in for Sydney 2000. One of the main contenders of this race was Yelena Nikolaeva, who was 30 years old at the time. She only took up athletics when she was 18. So she came to the sport really late. She was second at Barcelona. And this time she's going for gold. She's competing against fellow Russian and current world champion Irina Stankina. Stankina was disqualified in this race. She she got the, the red card at six kilometers and that left Yelena alone at the front. So she cruised to a pretty easy gold. She also got an Olympic record for this. This was not her only Olympics. She also competed at 2004 Athens eight years later, finished 17th. And she now serves in the Chuvash Republic, which is part of, it's like one of the Russian states. Uh, she serves on their state council committee on social policy, health, physical education, and sports. That's what I found from hmm. Olymp Media. So then you move over to the men's side, and you've got two very different races going on with the 20K and the 50K. So in the 20K, there was a pretty big battle and a big group of athletes. And they got to about 19 kilometers, and they're, they're down to like a pack of seven. And Jefferson Perez from Ecuador breaks away from the pack, and the next couple of people behind him who were uh, from Russia and Mexico, they just could not catch him. I was watching this little great. They called it a documentary, but and, and it was just kind of clips from this race. And you hear the commentator go, vamos, Jefferson, vamos. <laughs> during like because they have the, the tv footage from this so jefferson won gold when he goes into the stadium like when they when they started the stadium was pretty empty when they come back into the stadium to finish they're in front of eighty five thousand people and the crowd's going nuts right jefferson crosses the line at fur in first place ecuador's first ever olympic medal and he was also the youngest Olympic champion in this discipline. He was only 22. And that is young for race for race. Yeah, workers. right. Don't tell me he got disqualified. No, Please, no, 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 no. Break my heart. No, oh, it was fine. Me. It was fine. He won the gold, won the Olympic medal. He almost. I did wonder when I watched the medal ceremony, like how was the scramble to find Ecuador's anthem? Because oh, they right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're saying, okay, we're down to a pack of seven. Get these lined up. After the games, he walked 459 kilometers in a pilgrimage across Ecuador from Quito to his home in Cuenca. I know. <laughs> wow. And then along the way, shoes do you think he went through on that? I, I don't know. I don't know. And then he went on to compete in 2000 and 2004 and 2008. In the first two, he got fourth place for both of those. And then in 2008, he won the silver. So very. So he stu- stayed at the top of his game for a long time. Exactly. Also at the top of his game for a long time was Robert 
Kornizowski, who is from Poland. He was uh, in the 50K race. He was one of the favorites because in 1992, he had been disqualified and was one of the favorites back then, too. So I think you would like Robert because he trained in northern France. So his, his training days would be get up, eat breakfast, walk to Belgium, walk back to France and eat lunch. I'm sorry. I would have lunch in Belgium. I know. I would like some French fries. I had to reread that. That was in my favorite Olympic reference book by David Wallachinsky. I'm like, wait, I would I would walk to Belgium. I would have a snack and then I'd turn around and walk back to France. You know, some pommes frites. <laughs> and I'd be all set. Exactly. So he's one of the favorites going into 96. Other favorites are Valentin uh, Kanonen from Finland and Jesus Angel Ar- Garcia from Spain. So Garcia took the early lead, but he got dropped around 40 kilometers, and he also got disqualified at that time. Robert's pulling away from the pack, and he continues to pull away at 43 kilometers. He's pretty much sealed the deal, wins the gold. Kanonen finished seventh, and then the fr- surprise silver medalist was Mikhail Shenchenikov from Russia, who is only making his second start at this distance, right? That's like a story that we heard a lot of on uh, from like the 1920s. Like, oh, I just felt like doing this race. I've never done it before. Let me get a medal. You don't really hear too many stories like that once you get past you know, the 70s. Right. So Robert goes on to become probably the world's greatest race walker. In Sydney, he won the gold for both the 20K and the 50K. Only man to ever do that. Which is amazing. And he also won the gold in the 50K in 2004. It was all those trips to Belgium. uh, Maybe. But he retired in 2004, and now he does a lot of coaching and motivational speaking. He is also a Eurosport ambassador, expert, and host. So he's putting together programming around Tokyo 2020 for the Polish audience. And is also a member of the World Athletics Hall of Fame. I wonder if he's still walking to Belgium. I don't know. Maybe we can run into him one day. He does speak five languages. so Well, he can walk through every country in Europe. (laughs) You know, he can start in Poland and just keep going. So he has time to learn. Exactly. And he can pick up his, he can pick up Jefferson along the way. Because we know Jefferson can walk massive distances too. Vamos. (laughs) Vamos. <laughs> Vamos, Jefferson. Vamos. It's 100 days to Tokyo. It's actually less than 100 days to Tokyo. I know. As, as we tape, it's Wednesday. It is a hundred, 100 days to Tokyo. So as you listen to it, it will be less than 100 days. But it's still 100 days out. Oh my goodness. I know when you think about it, we were supposed to probably be in New York City in Times Square at a at a celebration of sorts. Colorado Springs. And instead we're watching a Team USA video. Yeah. Not quite the same energy. But they did they the athletes certainly were very enthusiastic. Exactly. At the Team USA Media Summit and we got lots of interesting stories and lots of people were going to talk to again, but it didn't quite have that same level of s'mores and Oreos that it did when we went to the Pyeongchang hundred days out. Exactly. Exactly. I was, I was missing snacks. Well, I guess we have to make our own now. I know. Do you remember those little gold? What were those gold? Oh, it was the Hershey's gold because that was their new caramel based candy bar. Those were so good. And the lady gave us so many of them. I was eating them the whole train ride home. I was on such. You know why I really think I enjoyed that day? Besides meeting everybody, I was on such a sugar high between the s'mores, my first s'mores, and the Oreos and the Chips Ahoy, and then the the Hershey Gold. I just needed some more snacks, apparently. 
Right. So last week we did do the Team USA Virtual Media Summit, and we'll have highlights from that over the coming weeks. Uh, we'll have a highlight later on in the show, actually. Um, and met a lot of great athletes, heard a lot of interesting stories. We're going to have some longer interviews based off of that. So that's something to look forward to. If you're in Australia, you're going to have the chance to go to a live site. So just as Tokyo 2020 was planning on live sites around the city for watching the Olympics together, Australia is going to do that all over the country. So they will have sites in Sydney at the Rocks and Sydney Olympic Park, Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, Adelaide, and then they're also doing a regional road show. You can go to olympicslive.com.au for more info. They've also got, this was a rabbit hole I went down, but not too far. Because they have details on how you can host your own live event. And then they have all the kit for it as well. And they have a whole catalog of stuff you can buy, like tents and big signage and things like that. But but when I looked at the prices, I went, oh, this is not meant for me. I cannot spend $1,000 or more and uh, have that shit to my house to put on my front lawn. <laughs> and we can't get people together yet anyway. Exactly. One other very cool thing that Australia is doing is Inside the Games reported that the Australian Olympic Committee is collecting artwork for from uh, students and they will select some of that and put it on the walls of the athletes' room in the Olympic Village. That's much nicer than getting buzzed by the New Zealand bracelet. Yeah, probably. Probably. That's very cute. So uh, we'll have a little bit more information on the show notes. The deadline for entries is June 4. Also, other 100 days out celebrations. The Canadian Olympic Foundation launched a Olympians Supporting Olympians bursary, which will provide financial support to 30 summer and winter Olympians and Olympic hopefuls. So that will help them with their training costs. The Olympic Channel has released an anime series called Heroes. This is a five-episode series that tells the origins of the Olympics and features ancient games and ancient athletes and their journeys. So I have not checked this out yet. I'm very curious as what this is going to look There's like. There's going to be lightning involved because all the anime series always have, you know, somebody. Oh, and I'm sure. Standing yeah. in front of, ba-boom. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be exciting. There's some Greek gods. Oh, yeah. And then Team USA also released its closing ceremony outfit, which is a lot okay, of white. It looks like a chef's outfit. It's all white. White polo, white jeans, white jacket with blue accents. Uh, the belt. I think the belt is cool because it's red, white, and blue. But I think it's it's also the only thing with color. Yeah, NBC Olympics uh, posted uh, pictures on its Instagram feed. And, and there's one of Katie Ledecky in that outfit looking very sad. Well, you would be sad, too, if you were putting this, you know, Pillsbury Doughboy of a closing ceremonies outfit. Well, and, you know, this is me. I just go, oh, white pants. No, stains right away. I'd, I'd spill everything on them instantly. Well, you know what? There's going to be so few people at the closing ceremony the that I guess, you know, the white pants will stay clean. Don't touch yeah, me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. That's how they're contact tracing people. It's like if there's any fingerprints on the white pants, then they know somebody's <laughs> been too close to you. Torch Relay update. This was so exciting to see. The 109-year-old woman, we talked about her last year when they talked about the Torch Relay. Kagawa Shigeko carried the torch. She made stayed it. Stayed alive. She stayed alive. She carried the torch, and she was pushed in a wheelchair for the whole time. They had the wheelchair, the fl the torch mounted on her wheelchair, but she did hold it at the beginning, and then they got her up out of the chair to stand to pass it off to the next torch carrier. It was she amazing. She was not going around, man. And she was waving the whole time. Uh, that's the good news on the, the torch relay. It's now having a really tough time. Not going forward, because it, once the torch is lit, they're moving forward with the relay, but there are several legs that are getting moved to places that have little to no spectators because they're having an issue with coronavirus cases in Japan, and uh, they really want to discourage crowds. And I know when, when I've watched it, there have been some places where it's been kind of crowded. 
So in Osaka, the torchbearers did laps in the Expo 70 commemorative park. And the only other people who were there were their guests who so they could be seen by by their friends and family uh, next week. It will not run on public roads in Matsuyama over virus concerns. So we'll see how this affects the torch relay schedule going forward. Japan Today announced, uh, reported that the organizing committee has set aside 300 hotel rooms for athletes who have minor or no COVID symptoms. So there's already this anticipation. But test positive. Yes, who test positive. So Might there's... as well have something to do with those hotel rooms since they're not allowing any yeah, foreign right. visitors. Yeah, I guess that would help. It, it's interesting that they're anticipating that there's going to be cases, too. But I guess you can't. And, and there's a lot of places where you can't help it. I think that most sports have had some incidents of COVID as they've continued to compete. But no massive breakout. So let's hope that there's no massive breakout. That those 300 rooms do not get used. Pretty much. Pretty much. The International Paralympic Committee will do a massive reduction on their guests that they allow into Tokyo. So much like the Olympic Committee told people we're, we're not having a lot of guests around, they, uh, the IPC is also not having a lot of accompanying guests. And they are significantly reducing the number of people that they themselves are credit for the IPC category. So no honorary board memberships, no honorary board members, and that kind of thing. They are doing their part to cut down the numbers. I also saw on Reddit that CoSport has gotten in touch with the Paralympic ticket holders that they sold to about their refunds or their option to keep the tickets. This is a good one. So somebody had screen capped the email they got. So this is I'm going to set that story up for you. I haven't really seen anything else in the in the regular press that's documented this. But uh, according to the screen cap and, and the conversation around it, Paralympic ticket holders have the option to request a refund or keep the tickets. And the, the keeping the tickets is you hope you can go to Japan somehow or you can transfer them to people in Japan. If you refund the tickets, you'll get face value, but your refund amount has to be at least $150. And if you don't have $150 worth of tickets, they will donate that money to the Ajitos Foundation, which is crazy. There was somebody on in the Reddit discussion who said, yeah, Paralympic tickets were so much cheaper. And we got some and our, our refund is like 100 bucks. And it's not even worth it. But you can't, but they won't process $100. Right. And it's, it, it, that's not fair, but they also don't, it's not worth it to them to fight for that $100. The time involved to get that money back would be too much. Wow. So that's a little. Yeah, Coast has not come off well. I don't think any of the ATRs are coming off well in this whole no, scenario. No, which makes me very, very curious what they're going to do with tickets going forward especially because they've been working on different solutions for beijing so we will and paris especially yes. has been yeah we'll see what happens speaking of beijing you know it's been nonstop boycott talk that's all we can hear about beijing now yes so one of the nice things about at, at the, the media summit that we went to for Team USA is that uh, Suzanne Lyons, who is the chair of the U.S. OPC Board of Directors, was very proactive in talking about how they felt about this boycott. We've got a little bit of tape from that. Take a listen. But I wanted to start um, with one of the things that happened yesterday, which I know many of you are interested in, which are the comments that were made by the State Department regarding the games in Beijing. So let me start there. Um, since yesterday, the State Department has clarified their position. They've denied that they were saying that a boycott was moving ahead, and they said that the Biden administration is more generally in talks with allies over uh, China's human rights violations. So, you know, I think we will continue to see a lot of discussion on the topic of boycotts. And I wanna just um, point out again, what we have said very consistently, 
We at the USOPC oppose athlete boycotts because they've been shown to negatively impact athletes while not effectively addressing global issues in the past. And um, you know, they also place honestly unfair pressure on our sponsors who provide the major financial support for our athletes and our athlete programs over the long term, not just for any single specific set of games. And for our athletes, their only dream is to represent the USA and what we stand for on the international field of play. So we certainly do not want in any way to minimize the serious human rights issues that are happening in China. But the US has many tools to constructively respond to these concerns, which we believe should be handled by government officials, including the Department of State and its team of ambassadors, trade negotiators, and other diplomats. We do not believe that Team USA's young athletes should be used as political pawns in these issues. Thank you so much, Suzanne. I really appreciated that. Yeah, the when I was taking notes, the first thing I wrote was good on you, Suzanne, for just addressing that right in your opening statement, not waiting for a question, not waiting, to, not playing any games, not being around the bush, just we know this is out there and we're on it. So it was very reassuring as a fan, never mind, you know, as a journalist side. So I had two hats on. And as a fan, I'm like, okay, they're they're doing as much as they can do to make sure the athletes will be competing in 2022, however that looks. Yes. So I hope that this boycott talk can die down a little bit. It won't. It won't. But as long as they keep putting out the fires, I'm okay with, you know, it's just like people are still talking about will Tokyo happen. They need to talk about something. They need to fill, they need their clickbait. They need to fill their spaces. Don't click on it. Don't click on it at all. It's like Kardashians. Just fill the pages. And that's really all that, that's the news. We're getting tons and tons of Tokyo stuff. Hundred Less than 100 days now. So it's getting real. It's getting real exciting. It's getting real scary for us. I'm scared. I'm scared. And, and I'm finally starting to be like, okay, we're going to, we're going to actually do this. And Tokyo is going to happen and everything's going to be okay. And we're going to make it through. I'm getting excited. I am getting excited. So it's going to be I'm a lot of fun. I have my rose quartz crystal right here. What does that do? Use it, it helps me manifest. That's what my daughter tells me. Manifest what? I'm manifesting that Tokyo 20, oh, okay. 20 in 2021 is going to be all okay. Let's hope. Let's hope that works. Hey, I'll take anything I can get. <laughs> I'll take crystals, I'll take lighting candles, I'll, whatever works, man. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think about race walking. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta and keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us next week for more Olympic stories. And as we go out to music by Archdale, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. I can worry about being amped in three hours.